Hi everybody, um, Kelly Baxter's here to talk to us about palliative care and uh, post-acute environment. So uh, please uh, welcome her to our facility. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Good afternoon, yeah. everybody. Thank you guys for taking the time out of your day to be here. I appreciate it. I understand some of you are probably at the end of your shift and some are coming in early before you start your evening shift. But I thank you for taking the time to come to talk about what's a very important topic I think in the health care of our patients particularly um, special to me I am a nurse practitioner I work for Care New England and I am an inpatient palliative care nurse practitioner so I see patients who come into the hospital setting at Kent Hospital women and infants Butler and Memorial and we do palliative care consults in the hospital um, I'm presenting today in collaboration with HealthCentrics, which is a quality improvement organization for New England. Um, and I am part of the Warwick Coalition. And uh, the coalition had done some surveys and um, through the local nursing homes to figure out how comfortable staff felt about really what is palliative care, how it's different than hospice, what it includes, what type of patients are appropriate for palliative care. Um, we also questioned on, did a survey and questioned staff in the local area, how comfortable are you with having conversations with patients who have progressive illness, advanced illness, terminal illnesses? How do we have goals of care conversations? So this in-service kind of um, uh, came together as a result of that survey, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So the first part of the session, the first few slides are going to be basic definitions about what palliative care is, what patients are appropriate. We're going to have a brief um, group exercise in the middle, and then the second half is going to be talking about communication skills, just some great examples of how we can communicate with our patients on really difficult and emotional topics. So thank you for being here today. This is informal. If you have a question, please stop. If you have a suggestion, if you have a patient experience that you want to share, I think that's wonderful. So please stop me at any time. Can everyone hear her? <clears throat> OK. So the objectives really came from the survey that we submitted to the staff um, to really understand what the difference between palliative and hospice care is to be able to identify patients appropriate for palliative care and how to place a referral through your facility um, and to improve the knowledge communication skills. So how do we have really good goals of care conversations with patients and families who have chronic illness, advancing illness, terminal illnesses? So that's the goal of why we're here today. Starting off with some very, very basic definitions on what is palliative care. Special medical care for people with serious illness. That feels like, okay, we take care of people who have lots of serious illnesses. Palliative care is really this gray area of patients where they're not at their healthiest. They may not be at end of life, but they have chronic progressive illnesses. They have COPD, they have CHF, they're in and out of the hospital, they have some functional declines, they're starting to have some dysphagia, some weight loss. How do we care for those patients as their health changes, as they age, as their symptoms may become worse, as they go in and out of the hospital? This specialty in palliative care really arose in the last, I'd say decade, maybe 10 to 15 years. It's really nationwide now. Lots of inpatient hospitals have palliative care programs. Um, we are incorporating palliative care services into nursing homes, into home care. It's really a valuable subset of care of how do we care for these patients when their illnesses are progressing? How do you maintain quality of life? How do you make sure that all of our interventions are focused on what they really want? So engaging patients to be part of their health care. That's what palliative care truly is. It's very important to note that it's appropriate at any stage of illness. So you don't get palliative care involved when there's nothing more we can do for you and you have end-stage cancer and palliative care is appropriate. Sometimes that's hospice care, but that palliative care is very much earlier, much upstream. You have a patient with COPD and now, oh, they're starting to bounce in and out of the hospital. They've been to the ED three, four, five times in the last six months. Okay, their illness is changing their illness is advancing, it's very important. Palliative care is much earlier in the disease process. It's not always meant for end of life. There's a lot of confusion about that, and I feel like I educate about that on a daily basis to physicians, to family members, even in the hospital, regularly. Oh, that my family's not ready for you. You know, we're still doing curative treatment. We're still treating the patient. Absolutely, absolutely. It does 
does not mean that we have to stop treatment. It doesn't mean that a patient needs to be DNR. It doesn't mean that the patient's at end of life. It's a patient with serious chronic illness who may have symptom management needs and is having some changing goals of care. Patient-centered, family-centered, optimizing, anticipating, preventing, and treating suffering. So a large part of not only treating symptom management is saying, I know these COPDers, you've seen them all, you've seen them over and over again, those end-stage COPDers, they're gonna have lots of dyspnea. They're gonna need energy conservation education. They're gonna have anxiety, which is related to their dyspnea as their illness progresses. How do we prevent, how do we anticipate what their symptoms are gonna be and prevent that, try to support that, try to put interventions in place to give them good quality of life knowing we can't cure that end stage COPD but we can manage it and we can make sure we're caring for the patient in the way they want to be cared for. So again appropriate for patients in all disease stage, stages excuse me including those being treated with curable illnesses um, living with chronic illness and those at end of life. So again hospice is a is a part of palliative care as an illness progresses and a patient is nearing end of life, it is a part of palliative care, but is not totally encompasses palliative care, which is much more throughout the disease process. I'm not gonna read the slides word for word, but certainly you have them for your reference. Lots of focus on symptom management, interdisciplinary care, good communication, what's important to the patient, what resources do they need? How do we keep them independent or functional as long as able? How do we incorporate all of these things? So really trying to provide holistic care on all levels for our patients. Um, features that characterize palliative care, interdisciplinary teams. So we meet weekly at the hospital, particularly I work in the inpatient setting, and on a weekly basis we sit down and we do very detailed IDT meetings for all of our patients. Spiritual care, psychiatry, social services, chaplain, pharmacy, um, nurses, physicians, doctors on our team, we all sit down and we really review each patient, all aspects of care for this patient um, to make sure that we're providing holistic care. Um, again, services are provided concurrently and independent. With palliative care, you don't have to give up anything to receive palliative care, to have someone coming in and talking about goals of care. Oftentimes, hospice people think, okay, hospice, you're shifting from cure to comfort, and that is true. So oftentimes you're limiting interventions. We're not drawing as much blood work or any, where um, we're not gonna be doing blood transfusions. We're not gonna be going back and forth to the hospital. Palliative care, you can continue with all of those interventions. It's an additional layer of support for patients whose health is changing as time moves on. Very important to initiate early in an illness, again, brand new cancer diagnosis, that's a great time to implement palliative care, to start a conversation with, oh my gosh, how are you dealing with this new diagnosis? What's important to you? Let's, let's talk about education, what this disease is going to look like. How can we anticipate symptoms? What types of resources or support groups does your spouse or your family need? Very, very important. It's very appropriate for early in a disease process. Again, focusing lots on quality of life and good communication with patients and family. So this, I love this. This is the American Cancer Society did um, some really great photos to talk about really what is palliative care. So as you can see, it says cancer and it's changed into dancer. So, so much of what we do is treating the illness. COPD in room five, CHF in room seven, end stage renal disease in room nine. What about Mr. Jones, who's a retired engineer who loves his dog and you know the most important thing is going to his grandson's softball game? It, it's, it's making sure that we're looking at the patient. We're treating the patient in the setting of an illness. So what's important to them? You know, in, in medicine, we have these algorithms. Okay, patient comes in with this, we're gonna do A, B, C, D, D. We're gonna do this, A, B, C, D, D. Palliative care is almost like a timeout. You know, you put a central line in or you do a procedure, it's like, okay, let's have a timeout. Do we have the checklist? Is everything ready? I feel that palliative care in these settings is a timeout and say, okay, we have this patient with this illness and these are all of the available treatment options, but let's pause for one minute and go to that patient and say, what's important to you? How have you lived your life? So now, providing education about illness and saying, and how does this fit into your life? And what things do you want us to do? And equally as important, what things do you not want us to do if it goes down this projected course? So it's really important to engage patients early, 
early in conversations. It's a hard conversation to have. A lot of people don't have because it's uncomfortable. Um, you know, oh, I can't go in there. I'm not, you know, I, I know that end stage renal, I'll just, you know, give them diuretics and we're going to go in and offer them dialysis. But why not pause and say, let's talk about dialysis. That's what's coming for you. Let me explain what that's going to look like in your life. And is that something you want? Patients can choose things that they want. And I think when we talk about choosing less care, people get scared and frightened about that. But if it's preserving that patient's quality of life, it's a reasonable choice. It's not our choice, it's a patient's choice. We need to engage them more, I think, in discussions about their chronic illness. Why do we need palliative care? 90% of Americans die uh, after living with chronic progressive illnesses. So unfortunately, we all have that to look forward to as we age in that chronic illness is a fact of life for a lot of our patients. Um, <clears throat> and many die from a result of having prolonged or progressive chronic illnesses. So why we need this palliative care subset, again, this gray area, these patients, some are not always at end of life, but they're not their sick, they're healthiest, and they're, they fall in this gray area called palliative care, trying to preserve good quality of life as their illness is changing and advancing, re-clarifying goals of care as their illness progresses or maybe pro uh, starts to lead to more hospitalizations, but making sure we're keeping the patient at the center of all of that. What is most important to that patient? Why in nursing homes? So this is some um, data that was taken through uh, Health Centric's Palliative Care Collaborative, which was a statewide collaborative to um, help with education and really develop palliative care in nursing homes. 1.5 million Americans live in a nursing home, and this is projected to increase to 3 million. So you all who work in a nursing home setting, these, this is your patient population. This is, is going to be more patients as time goes on, more patients living longer with chronic illness. It's going to be really important that we incorporate palliative care thinking into how we care for these patients. And many patients now, studies show, die in nursing homes than they do at home as they had many years ago. I think due to a lot of things, um, family members can't care for aging parents as they have to work. There's a lot of different responsibilities that they juggle. So again, nursing homes is really where people spend the final years of their life um, as they're getting sicker and uh, it's really important to, to your patient population for sure as well as many others. So those are just some statistics I wanted to share. So again, palliative care, the relief from suffering, making sure we're treating spirit, uh, distressing symptoms and incorporating spiritual and psychological care. All of those encompass palliative care. Some of these slides you, you'll see are a little bit redundant, but I just want to kind of bring home the point. It's so important. I went to a conference on palliative care, a national conference, and one of the speakers got up and said, you know, I was explaining palliative care to a patient and they misunderstood me and they're saying what is this palliative care what is this palliative care and she said I kept saying it's palliative care palliative care and she said but it made me stop and pause and say isn't that exactly what palliative care is a palette of care so thinking about it and I just think it's a great visualization when you look at it that way you know this is the patient's COPD this is their spiritual needs these are their cultural factors these are you know their family resources there's their symptom management it's a palette of care we want to care for this patient on all the different levels that make them who they are and again engage them in conversations about what's important to them. So I, I just felt like that was a great visual. If you remember nothing from today, <laughs> this is the most important slide to me. And I feel like this is something I talk about over and over and over again because everyone says palliative care is hospice care. Hospice care is a component of palliative care at end of life when patient's illness has progressed to a terminal end of life process. Palliative care is, is different in that it is appropriate with chronic illness at any stage of illness. They do not need to be hospice eligible. They do not need to be at end of life. Any stage of chronic illness, along with curative treatment, can provide assistance with goals of care and symptom management, as I said. Hospice care is a Medicare benefit that you have to meet certain criteria based on a hospice diagnosis. So we have this diagnosis. The patient has all of these criteria factors that we can surmise to say that this patient has a limited life expectancy of six months or less. We've had hospice patients that have lived two years, three years. We've had hospice patients that live less than six months. However, 
they have to meet this criteria and they have to be at a point where they are saying they want to shift from cure to comfort. So their goals are, I no longer want aggressive workup. I have a terminal illness, I'm certified for hospice care, but now I want to focus primarily on symptom management. So that is hospice care. Palliative care is different. So I just want you to be able to, because families get confused. You know, we come in at the hospital and, and I introduce myself as a palliative nurse practitioner. And sometimes I'm coming in for pain management and chronic illness. And they go, oh my God, you're with hospice care. Oh my God, they didn't tell us things were that bad. So it's constant education. And I think if patients and families are asking you about these things, it'll be great for you to be able to distinguish the difference. Because otherwise, people are reluctant to even consider palliative care because they think it's end of life care. And we're missing a great opportunity to really give them the palliative care snuggle, as we like to call it in our office, you know? So it's like we're missing out on being able to really provide some great care for patients if they don't know the difference. This is the new model of palliative care. Again, this, this um, field has emerged in the last 15 years. <clears throat> it used to be we do everything we can to treat you. I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do, hospice care and there's, no, there's nothing in the middle. Again, this is that gray area that I'm describing. It's, it's a layer of support. Palliative care can be involved with diagnosis, treatment of illness, um, continued management of disease. So it's, a, it's the new focus of palliative care. These are patients, so I'm sure you could look at this and think of many patients that are here who have these diagnoses that are truly appropriate for palliative care. It's all your chronic illnesses, things that are going to progress over time, um, things that are going to have symptoms associated with them, families that are going to be at crossroads of making really difficult health care decisions, G-tubes in advanced dementia patients who can no longer eat, uh, whether or not to be intubated or even a trach in patients who have end-stage COPD or ALS or MS. I mean, these are chronic illnesses and it's not uncommon to think we're gonna have to have some really hard conversations as patients' illnesses progress. So these are all the types of patients we see in the hospital and in the outpatient setting for palliative care. This is just an example. There's a lot of great palliative care tools that you can use in your facility just to identify patients, and it gives a list of diagnoses. You take a particular patient and you score it based on the diagnoses they have, based on their functional status, and then some other criteria. Have they um, had uncontrolled symptoms? Have they had recent multiple ED visits or so many admissions within six months period of time, would they be appropriate for a palliative care consult? So this is just one example, but you can Google palliative care screening tools and there's a lots of different examples um, available. So in terms of referral, um, from working with the coalition, each of the nursing homes in the area has said that they do have a process for referring patients for palliative care. I will say, where the confusion still lies, again, between palliative and hospice care, a lot of the palliative care programs are provided by hospice agencies. Not unreasonable because oftentimes those hospice nurses, those hospice docs, are familiar with caring with patients who have lots of symptom burden, patients whose diseases are progressing. But it confuses everybody too because they say, okay, we're going to call the hospice agency for palliative care, but they're not on hospice, but they're on palliative care. Lots of confusion around that. Um, but I do know that in the nursing home arena, most of the palliative care consultations, correct me if I'm wrong, are provided by local hospice agencies that have palliative teams. So it's for patients who are not hospice, not, maybe not choosing hospice or not eligible for hospice yet, um, but they are sending out nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians to start some discussions and to do some symptom management. So really, if you identify a patient that you think is appropriate, bringing it to your charge nurse, bringing it to the administrator, and within each facility, there should be a referral process to an agency that can come in and, and again, provide some guidance, some additional layer of support. I will say the Palliative Care Nursing Home Collaborative was um, put into play last year. It was, uh, I believe, how, how long was it, Maureen, a 15-month program? It was that, my care, my choice. Okay, and it was, it was going in and doing training and education in nursing homes to really say, let's make sure we have a foundation of palliative care just within our infrastructure. We don't need to call people in to provide palliative care. Are we as a community or as we as an organization providing attention to patients' spiritual needs, patients' psychological needs, their symptom needs? 
<clears throat> okay, so we're going to pause for about 10 minutes and we're going to do a very brief exercise. The next session, the next half of the session is going to be on communication skills and how to have communication. So everybody on their table in their little groups has a, pack, a deck of cards. So what I'll ask you to do is open up those cards and deal them out to whoever's sitting at your table so you each have an equal amount of cards. So you can just kind of deal them out so everybody has an equal amount of cards within that package. So how was that? Was that hard to do? Did you feel that was easy to do? Have you seen these cards before? They're called Go Wish cards. So instead of Go Fish, they're Go Wish. And they came about as to be a tool to help talk about what's important to us in our lives. Does anybody want to share? Was it hard? Was it easy? Did you feel like you could relate to some of the cards? Or what did you think? It was hard. It was hard? How come? Hard to think? Because some of them, all of them are kind of important. So it's hard to hard say which ones are the most important. Hard to prioritize yeah. what's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Conversations, you know, these are, when patients get sick, when our family gets sick, not even patients, when our families get sick, when we see our parents age, when we have siblings and God forbid children who are sick. Really, really hard to talk about these things. Nobody wants to think about end of life. Nobody wants to think about getting sicker because if we think about it, somehow it's going to happen faster. It's going to come sooner for us. So if we just ignore it and live in this rose-colored glasses world, it, it seems safer place. But I think times are changing where we're realizing we need to talk about these things. We need to engage people into having discussions. They're hard discussions, but they are so, well, so important and so wonderfully enlightening that it's, it's, it's really necessary um, and important. You know, if you think about, we plan, we plan all sorts of things in our lives. We're getting ready to go to college. We pick what college you want to go to and you plan and where you're going to go and you go and look at different schools. You're getting married. You think about, you plan all these aspects of your wedding day. You're having a baby. Do I want to have a home birth? Do I want to have drugs? Do I not? Where do I want to be when I have my baby? We plan all of these things in our life and oftentimes around exciting things, something you know, positive and exciting. We are all going to die at some point. Sorry if that's a news, <laughs> news flash to anybody in here. And that's a hard thing to think about. None of us want to think about that. But why wouldn't we invest as much thought in that as we do in other aspects of our life to say, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. But this is really important. These are the things that are going to be really important to me at the end of my life, that I'm where I want to be, whether that's with my family, that I'm medicated appropriately, that I'm alert so I can engage with my family, or that if my pain's too severe, I'm okay with being sleepy. I just want to be comfortable. Thinking about those things, hard things to think about. So I do this for a living every day with palliative care. Talk lots, meet with lots of families. Oftentimes, again, I work in the inpatient setting. We're in an acute crisis or something acute happening. You're meeting with families and patients that are really anxious. They're at some crossroad where talking about intubation, we're talking about dialysis, some acute crisis, and it's really, really hard conversations to have. So I said to myself, you know, I do this every day. I don't know what my, parent, my own parents would want. So I took the pledge. I said, that's it. I'm going to have a conversation with my own family, and I have to share it with you. It was really hard. It was really, really hard. So I had talked with my mother about it. I said, I think you and dad, my parents both just retired. I'm one of four children. I said, I think we should get together and just talk about if you and dad were to get sick, if, if you were to have a stroke, mom, I don't even know, would you want a feeding tube? Would you want these things? I think we should get the family together. My mother said, oh, absolutely. My mom's a nurse too. Absolutely. I just want it to be our nuclear family. No spouses, no kids, just, you know, the core kids and mom and dad. So I send, my first mistake was I send a text to my brothers and sisters and say, hey, we're going to meet at mom and dad's for pizza Saturday night and talk about, and talk about what, you know, what our wishes would be if we get ill. My phone lit up faster than the Christmas tree. My sister's like, mom's got cancer. She told you you're the nurse. Oh my God, oh my God, how long does she have to live? My brother's calling, what? Talk about what? What do we want? It was like... Everybody in my family, as you can see, I talk with my hands. We're Portuguese. Like, everybody was so excited about it. Like, oh, my God. Like, it was some disastrous thing. And I said, 
nobody's sick, nothing's going on, we just want to get together and talk about it. It was emotional. It was hard to have that conversation. We ask our patients to do this all the time, right? You know, when they're getting sick, we ask these families to come together and have a really hard conversation. It's hard to do. For me, we laughed, we cried as a family, but I was able to find out things about my family that I never knew. My dad wants to be cremated and he wants to go around Seekonk Speedway in a race car on a victory <laughs> lap before he gets bur buried at the Veterans Cemetery. Okay, uh, I never knew that. You know, my brother's a fireman and he said, my wife knows exactly what I do and don't want, but I want to be in my dress blues. You know, that's important to me. My oldest sister is divorced with one child. She doesn't have a spouse. She doesn't have a serious boyfriend. And she said, you know, nobody knows what I want. I want you to be my health care proxy. I'm going to do a, a DPOA form next week. It generated conversation. Is that the last conversation I'm ever going to have with my family about advanced directives or about illness or sickness? It's certainly not. Fortunately, we're all well and healthy now. But it generated some conversation to say, what's important to us? And I feel like you have to almost start with yourself and your own family before we can expect our patients to do this. So I would encourage you to do that. As hard as it is, just start some conversation with your family. This is the conversation project, which focuses on everything that we just talked about. This little trifold. In your handout, I apologize, the print off came a little light on this, but this is a nationwide campaign to engage people in talking about what their wishes are. It's a great, great website if you go to conversationproject.org. It has great tools about how to talk with your doctor, how to talk with your family. It gives some really great statistics here and it says 90% of people think that it's important to talk about their end of life care. 30%, less than 30% have actually done so. 70% of people say they would prefer to die at home. 70% of people die in a hospital, a nursing home, or a long-term care facility. 80% <clears throat> of seriously ill patients said they want to talk to their doctor about end-of-life care. 7% have done so. So it shows you, you know, people were uncomfortable with this, but we got to get better about it. We have to talk because that's how we can have control at the end of our life. That's how we can preserve dignity by really being clear about these are the things I want, these are the things that I don't want, and this is who I want involved in my decision making. So the Conversation Project is a great resource, a great website. Um, it has a lot of really great tools for not only your patients, but for yourself. These are some of the statistics that I just read. I wanted to include this, so this is from the American Nurses Association, and it's a position statement. It's saying, as nurses, we have responsibility to care for the dying patients, to educate our patients and families about end-of-life issues, preferences, um, to communicate and advocate for our patients. So not only is it just the right thing to do for our patients and families, as nurses, for all the nurses in the room, this is part of our job, this is part of our responsibility as nurses to our patients and families. Why, to have, why have the discussion? I think we have all seen good deaths, and unfortunately we've all seen bad deaths, whether that's in the patients we care for, whether that's in our own family. We know when it can go well, as sad as it is, when a patient has a comfortable death with family beside them and they're not alone, those are good deaths. We've seen patients die very traumatically. I know I have an intensive care unit in the ED setting. Um, why do we have these discussions to talk about how we can control some of that situation? Can we control all end of life? Can we control unexpected things? Certainly not. But by having some conversation, we can really allow for um, different options at end of life, particularly uh, as patients who are dying. So having a sense of closure, leaving a legacy, um, recognizing impending death. A lot of people say, oh, you know, wow, you, I've had a lot of patients say, oh, you go around, you do this every day for a living, oh, that's awfully depressing. <laughs> Where's your sickle? You know, and people think it's like, oh my gosh, you go from room to room and talk about DNR, DNI, and hospice, and death, and dying. And I do see very sick patients, the sickest of the sick, and in the hospital, I tend to get them when they're in an acute crisis, so they are, things are really happening. I have found this work, though, to be incredibly rewarding in that patients are reflective about their life. Um, you've never met this patient and family before, and it's like you have this little peephole into their life, the things that are important. People prioritize. When you're sick or you're approaching end of life, your priorities 
shift very, very quickly, and really many of them focus on, on the core things that are important in their lives. And I think that's rewarding. Uh, you know, we all bring something to this world, and, and you can find it in each and every patient. Um, and I think it's the most clarity is when people are at sick or in their final stages of, of life. Um, communication and advanced illness. Just gonna Whoops, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> very important, lots of education to talk about why illnesses are advanced, um, what treatments have been tried, um, what's the course of illness. So I spend a lot of time talking about disease trajectory, and we should. You know, we, we, it's our job to educate patients to talk about where is this illness going. Many, 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 many families in the hospital do not know that dementia is a terminal illness. You know, they feel, oh, people, you don't die from dementia. You die from a heart attack die from pneumonia, you die from different things, but you don't die from dementia. Dementia is a terminal illness. Oftentimes those patients die from either a sepsis or a pneumonia that is related to their dysphagia, which is a result of their deterioration from their advanced dementia. So dementia can be a terminal illness, and it's lots of education about that with patients and families and being able to have ongoing conversations. Um, you know, we always encourage in the hospital setting, continued conversations. It's, it's hard, they're in acute care, they're coming in, they may be in for a number of days or a number of weeks, but these are the patients we wanna be reconsulted on when they continue to come in because you're continuing that conversation to say, this is how functional mom was in March of this year. She was back for three or four hospitalizations. Let's look at her functional status. Now let's talk a little bit about that. That's advancing illness. That's changing, that's progression of illness. How do we best care for mom? How do we support her changing healthcare needs and get extra resources? How do we support the family? So lots of education about progression of illness. The role of the nursing home staff. You are, many of these patients, family. You are their family. You see them day in, day out. You know their likes, their dislikes. You know what they like to eat. You know what bathrobe they want on at night and what fluffy slippers they prefer to wear. You know their story, their life's journey. So it's so important for you all to be engaged and involved in these discussions because you are their family. You know them well. You're familiar with their medical history, as it says. You, you, know, you know the family dynamics. You can support and be patient advocates for your patients. Um, <clears throat> do you have primarily more of a long-term care, or, or is it mixed? I'm wondering mixed. kind of mixed. Yeah. So you have short-term and long-term <coughs> care patients, okay. Which is true of most nursing facilities. Um, barriers to having conversations. So these are all the reasons why we don't want to have conversation. It's uncomfortable. I'm going to say the wrong thing. Um, I'm going to start to cry. I've cried with many families and many family meetings. That shows your empathy, that shows you're human. This is a human nature aspect. There is, there is no harm in crying. If the family's consoling you and you're sobbing, then maybe you need to take a step outside for a second and, and recollect. But, but I have cried with many families because if that's your natural response, it's okay to do. And that, and that shows that we care for the people that we're caring about. Um, you know, I've had family meetings that I've gone in and come out and go, wow, that one didn't go well. Either the choice of words was wrong, or the, the dynamic, or the family was in a different spot than maybe I had thought they were. As long as we are going in with good intentions, trying to do the best, and really caring for this patient, I, I can't say it, it, it's, it's more wrong not to have the conversation than to stumble through it a little bit. Um, moral distress is another barrier. So, Inability to communicate, discomfort with conversations. I do know some of the other nursing homes that were involved in the collaborative identified in their agency, or in their facility, excuse me, nurses who felt comfortable, who just felt a little more comfortable with engaging residents in conversations. So they had nurse champions, and they said, okay, you know, I feel comfortable starting a conversation about advanced care planning in a patient who's has progressive illness or a patient whose dementia is getting worse and I feel comfortable with this. So within your own facility you can identify, not, you know, we all have strengths and weaknesses, you can identify staff members that would feel maybe more comfortable, particularly because you have some long-term residents that you all, that will be here over a course of time that you can build relationships and continue conversations with. Um, I have to have a comment on hope, maintaining hope. So, you know, I keep referring to our team uh, because this is the nature of what I do every day in the inpatient setting that, you know, oftentimes we come back to our office and feeling, feeling sad that we have gone and kind of popped the bubble, 
you know, we always feel like, oh my God, we popped a, I popped a lot of bubbles today. That's how we refer it. Feeling bad, like I went into a family who maybe had some unrealistic expectations that mom was going to improve or that things were going to get better. And we sat down and had a really hard conversation and said, let's look at this illness. Let's look at where things are headed. And feeling emotional about that, um, when you're trying to give people well-educated discussions about what's important, I will tell you that we've done a lot of, um, we do journal clubs once a month where we review different articles and case studies. And we've had a few, both of our social worker and our chaplain talk about hope and how you maintain hope in the setting of chronic illness or terminal illness. Because we feel that oftentimes everybody says, I don't want to have that conversation because I don't want to take away their hope. The oncologists have said it. I don't want to tell them that. I don't think they're going to tolerate any more treatment because I feel like that's what they're hopeful for. So a lot of our discussions are redefining hope and saying, you know, your hope has been for a cure. I don't know that, that we're going to get there. I don't know that there's a cure that's going to come of this illness or there is not going to be a cure. Being very straightforward, saying, but let's talk about what we can hope for. We can hope that you can be in a setting that you're with your family. We can hope for really good symptom management. We can hope to get you strong enough so that you can go to Myrtle Beach. We just had a patient, a young woman who newly diagnosed pancreatic cancer, which is very progressive and rapidly growing. And she wanted to go to Myrtle Beach, where she was born and raised, to go to the beach that she first grew up on. And um, that's a great hope. And that's awfully emotional. And we were like, how can we make this happen? And we made it happen. You know, that was her hope. So initially, I'm sure her hope was at diagnosis. I want treatment. I want a cure. And she was still getting treatment. The cure, I don't think there was a cure. She was very advanced. It was a terminal disease. But we redefined her hope and reshifted her hope and tried to make those things happen and those things possible. Um, unfortunate consequences of not having conversations. We're talking a lot about this multiple transitions back and forth to the hospital at end of life, maybe aggressive end of life care because we've never had a conversation with a patient um, versus having a conversation and knowing what they do and don't want at end of life. Um, and so communication, very, very important in what we do as healthcare providers. Um, you know, I like this quote. It says, the way you communicate is part of your work as a healer. We're not born with communication skills. We learn them. And that's so true. Just like as you, in your years of nursing or healthcare experience, you learn. You learn from your experience in patients that you're caring for. And it's the same with communications. You learn what's good, what works with certain families, and, and it's important to, to, to try that and trust in yourself. I'm not going to, I'm going to read a little bit of the next few slides, but I'm just going to give some patient examples. I will say that this handout here, I'm not going to go through this word for it, this has really, really great tools with really great examples of how to start conversations with patients, how to engage them in conversations, how to talk about different things, how to diffuse family conflicts. So I will just reference to this because I think it's kind of a summary of a lot of great resources that are out there to have conversations and to make you a little bit more comfortable with how to have difficult conversations. So certainly therapeutic communication, all of which we know, effective listening, clarification, reflection, empathy, supporting patients and families, understanding, how do we assess an understanding? Um, <clears throat> I will say, I always start with what's your understanding? What have the doctors told you? What's your understanding of illness? Because you may walk into a room and think the patient is here and they're here. I have a patient now, a young gentleman, I, I think young, 58 years old, who's in the hospital. He's very, very sick. He has um, diabetes. He has end-stage kidney disease as a result of his diabetes. He has multiple amps. He's missing below the knee amputation on the right. He has all of his toes off on his left foot. Um, multiple digits missing. He's got cardiomyopathy, COPD. Very, very sick man. Um, he has an acute GI bleed. His creatinine's five. He's on a Lasix drift. He's right on the cusp of dialysis. Um, and I called his son with his permission to talk a little bit about how we can care for him. And it's interesting. I said, so what have the doctors told you and what's an understanding of your dad? Well, I think he's really weak and I think we got to get him fitted for his prosthetic leg so he can get up and start moving around because he's not going to get better if he didn't move around. Now we're talking about a hemoglobin of five, a creatinine of five, a, a very sick patient who ultimately could die and not survive this hospitalization 
But that was extremely important for me to start that conversation with what have the doctors told you? What's your understanding of your dad's illness? Because he's not here. He's over here. You know, and I think it's really getting a sense of where people are at and meeting them exactly where they're at. Is it right or wrong that he's over here? Absolutely not. Is that denial? Possibly. Is that maybe lack of education and he, and he hasn't been informed as to how very sick his dad is or the number of medical problems? But I think that's always the best place to start. What is your understanding? Because you'll read the chart and you'll go in to see a patient and you think that they have heard things before. Oh, they have end stage, you know, end stage cardiac disease. Their cardiologist must have talked with them about, you know, an EF of 15 is prognostically a poor thing. And you go in and that patient and family has no idea. So really getting a, always starting with assessment of what does the patient know, where are they, and then working from that point on. Um, really, really important. Tell me more. Um, can you explain what you mean? Can you tell me what you're worried about? How can I be of help? A lot of a lot of time that I do when I see new patients is spent in sitting and listening, letting them tell you their story. That's a lot of processing in that when a patient, particularly a patient with cancer, to say, all right, I was diagnosed 14 years ago. And you sit down and you're like, okay, this is going to be a long, a long one. And, but there's something therapeutic in that process, meeting a patient for the first time and them telling you the course of events, their treatment course, their medical history, all of the things that have gone on. There's therapeutic process happening there before your eyes with patients being able to process those things. So I think being able to let patients talk and tell you their story and how it's personalized to them. Assessing coping mechanisms are important. Um, where are families getting their support? Do they have family support? Do they have family estrangements where they, they have very limited social supports? How do families communicate? Again, I'm Portuguese. We get a little excitable, <laughs> hence my trying to have a conversation with my family and everybody going, oh my god, what's going on? You know, com families communicate very different. Um, and it's important to recognize all of those factors at play when you're talking with patients and family. And when you think about it, when patients are sick or something acute's happening, that's when everybody's anxieties are high and, and there's a lot of tension. So you can, being aware of that walking into a meeting it will help diffuse some of, of those things. So defining goals of care, I think lots of talk about what's important to you. Where do you see, what are you hopeful for? Where do you see your life in the next few months or the next year? What do you hope to happen or in, within that time? And again, we're talking lots about health care. It might be something very simple about, I want to get home to see my cat. I want to, we had an end-stage dialysis patient who was in and out of the hospital. Oh my goodness, when I, I was a nurse in ICU at Kent before I went back for my nurse practitioner. So I'd worked in Kent for many years. Left when I first got my NP, worked uh, for home and hospice care of Rhode Island, and then came back to care New England as an NP. And I remember her from my ICU days, and she was in and out of the hospital, an end stage renal patient, had nobody lived by herself, but came in and out, not particularly compliant. But I had the fortunate honor to care for her at the end of her life within the last year. And the most important thing to her was her cat who was in the apartment, which was why she was not compliant because she never wanted to leave this cat to go to dialysis. And we were all like, is the cat alive? Like, is there really a cat here? Sure enough, the social worker went to say was the cat and we were able to bring the cat into her before she died. Again, you know, we go, oh, that was what was important to her. She had no family. She had strained family. That cat was her lifeline. I think those are really important things. And, and I feel like, okay, we were able to bring her some closure and comfort at the end of her life by knowing that that cat was important to her. Talking with family members, um, healthcare decision makers, how do we support them? How do we have discussions um, <clears throat> and take care of families? Um, Lots of families struggle with, I don't want to make a decision for mom. I don't want to make the decision not to intubate mom. So I think by encouraging conversations where fa patients are, are expressing their wishes, it, it really helps families grieve better because mom has made her decision and families are just supporting and advocating those decisions. Um, communication tools, these are all within your packet. Ask, tell, ask, again, always starting with what's your understanding and clarifying what the patient understands and then asking again, how do you, un you know, um, uh, do you understand where your illness is? Do you understand what the doctors have said? I wish, I use that a lot in my practice. I wish, you know, I wish we could say that this is going to be curable. It's not, so let's talk about what things we can do, what things we can hope for. 
hope worry technique. I hope that you will do well for a long time, but worry that you may not. How can we focus on those things? So there's lots of little acronyms that are really helpful. Again, do I expect you guys to read this tonight and come in tomorrow and go, I'm a pro at <laughs> conversations. I'm going to use the hope technique. I'm going to use this. I think just being aware that it's important to have conversations and starting there, talking with families and patients about what's important to them. Um, again, more, more tools on how to reframe why certain treatments aren't working, expecting emotion, allowing families uh, time to process what you're telling them, mapping out what's important, and redefining goals of care, making sure, that, again, th that our care is matching what they want and what they wish for. There's some uh, discussion about uh, nonverbal expressions of empathy. Again, this seems really standard and normal. You learn this in general nursing school, open body posture, relax. It's so true. Sitting down beside the bed to talk with a patient and family instead of standing over at the end of the bed or everybody, you know, when you're having a family meeting, sitting mixed with the family versus this is us and this is them. There's a lot of different techniques. You don't think it works. It sets the tone. It sets the whole, a whole different tone if you're aware of those things. Um, so this is language that has been helpful in my practice. I talked about what is your understanding of illness. When I'm talking about code status and advanced directive, DNR, DNI does not mean do not treat. A lot of people say, oh my gosh, well I don't want to be a DNR, DNI because if I'm having a heart attack, they're not going to come down here. They're not going to treat me. Very, very different. DNR, DNI means if your heart should stop or your breathing should stop, would you want us to implement artificial resuscitation or would you want us to allow that as the natural process? That's what DNR, DNI means. If your heart should stop and you die, would you want us to revive you? Very, very different than do not treat. Very different, very different than CMO. So I think a lot of people really kind of educating patients and families to say, if your heart should stop as a natural process at the end of your life or as a progression of your disease, would you want us to do artificial interventions to revive it? Does not mean, and reassuring patients and families, if you're short of breath, we're going to treat you. If, if you have an infection, we're going to give you antibiotics. If you have a heart attack, we're going to treat you, your heart attack. This means if your heart should stop. So really kind of clarifying that with patients. Talking about withdrawal of care versus redirecting care. Again, the use of language is so important with patients and families and being able to say, you know, working in ICU, terminal extubation, we're going to withdraw life support. When you think about that as a family member, you're taking something away from my loved one. You're taking away. If you use the terms, we're going to redirect care based on what your mom has expressed she would want. We're going to redirect care to focus on her comfort. We're going to redirect. I think a very strong use of words. Making sure we're doing everything that patients want us to do, nothing more than they would want us to do, and allowing for natural um, death. <clears throat> These are just some additional communication things that you guys can look at, talking about weighing risks and benefits of intervention, always incorporating cultural, spiritual beliefs with our patients, um, and consistent use of language. And these are just a few more. So again, listening to our patients, never meant to be one conversation. I'm going to go in today and have a goals of care conversation. Ongoing conversation, particularly for your patients or your residents that you know, talking with them and saying, what, what's most important to you? What are you afraid of? And engaging them in conversations. This is the last slide, and it's really just meant to highlight and I'm sure you guys are aware there is a MOLST form. So when we do talk with patients and families about what they want, in particular in terms of resuscitation, rehospitalization, artificial hydration and nutrition, this is from the state of Rhode Island Department of Health to really clarify what's important to patients and families. So I'm ending on this, making sure that we're asking patients, you know, instead of asking what's the matter with them, what matters to them. And I think that really brings home what palliative care is, what matters to patients in the setting of chronic illness and serious illness. 302, two minutes, two minutes after, I'm sorry. So thank you guys for coming. Thank you for engaging in the um, activity. I hope that was helpful.